Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the L. Ron Hubbard Theater in Hollywood, California. Tonight, we present a live broadcast of the Golden Age Radio Hour, featuring L. Ron Hubbard's adventure story, The Iron Duke. Two men strode hurriedly through the black of the Aldorian night. Beyond them, against the stars, loomed the foothills of the Balkan spur known as Bacchist Range. Far off, a train whistled three ghostly notes. Uh, I'm froze. Why didn't you tell me it was this cold in the, in the Balkans? Quit chattering. If a patrol hears those teeth, they'll think we've got a machine gun. Whoa, don't mention machine guns. They make me think of firing squads. Gosh, Blackie, aren't we ever going to get across the frontier? Take it easy, sweetheart. When I stopped running back there, we crossed the frontier. We're in Eldoria. Blackie, what do we do for passports? Take it easy, sweetheart. Huh? Hear that? About a mile away, the headlight of the locomotive was growing. We can't get on that. We haven't got any Aldorian dough. And they'll ask for our passports and the Nazi government. Have and... I ever let you down? No. But, yeah. You said they wouldn't find out them artillery shells was loaded with sand and that the machine guns had solid barrels until we collected the cash. And now look at us. Broke in a postage stamp Balkan state. Why didn't I? Why didn't you let us try for the coast where it's warm? Somewhere around here, there will be a grave marked Stub Doyle, unless I hear large quantities of quiet. Okay, Blackie. But when I think of that nice checkered top coat back in the... The locomotive snorted and squealed and rattled to a halt beyond the station, leaving the last car abreast of the two. Blackie Lee gave Stub a boost and then swiftly followed himself. The train was already starting when they found an empty compartment and shortly after... When the train master glanced in on his way by, his attention was in no way attracted by the passengers therein, curled on the seats. Stub Doyle, as soon as the menace was passed, paid more and more attention to Blackie Lee. Blackie was sitting up again, looking absently through the window at the flying night. He was a handsome fellow. He had the easy, careless air of the cosmopolitan. And there was something about him that suggested that he commanded any situation in which he found himself. At least once a day, Stubb wondered why he had ever allowed himself to become associated with as nerve-wracking a fellow as Blackie Lee. And there was such a nice bottle of anisette in my trunk. You suppose I'll ever see that bottle again, Blackie? Probably. Never. And that nice new suit with the yellow stripes? It's probably adorning the porter of the King's Hotel. If his tasting clothes is as bad as yours. Gosh, you really think so, Blackie? You're lucky not to have that suit full of holes with you in back of each hole. Yeah, yeah, you're always telling me how lucky I am to be alive. <laughs> you pull me through hell and high dives with one of your ideas, and then when we escape on the razor edge of execution, you tell me how lucky I am. I'm not complaining, you understand, but... Sometimes I think my nerves just won't stand it anymore. Tonight we should have been dining with generals and getting paid real money. But here we are on a train without tickets in a country which we didn't enter legally without so much as an Aldorian dime or a forged birth certificate. You haven't forgotten how to use a pen. Yeah, but now I haven't even got a pen. Sometimes, Blackie... The train came to a screaming halt, nearly throwing Stubb into the middle of the floor. He clutched the sill, staring with terrified eyes at Blackie. Oh, the conductor saw us. The Austrians figured we'd shuttle across the frontier and snag this rattler. Hell's bells, Blackie, what are we going to do now? Sit tight and hope. They'd send word that we were in the country without papers. Blackie, I can hear the rats in the dungeons already. Blackie was giving the troops outside the window an interested examination. A patrol was splashing flashlights along the side of the track and boarding the train at the next car. We're in for it now, and me without so much as a drink. 
They sat very still, hearing the patrol going through the cars ahead. The search was coming closer. The compartment door was thrown open by the train master, who consulted his record as to address the occupants by name. The lieutenant in charge of the patrol was all business as he waited for the train master to speak up. Well? Your Honor, I have no record of the two gentlemen in there. Ah. The lieutenant's smile of triumph suddenly congealed upon his face, and then this was swept away by a stolid parade ground expression, and looking straight ahead, his heels close together, the lieutenant spoke. My apologies, Your Highness. We are searching for one Balchard, leader of the Sons of Freedom, reported to have been on this train. My stupidity, Your Highness, is only that of zeal. Uh, may I be granted the favor of remaining aboard and, and posting an adequate guard over your uh, compartment? I do not care to have attention called to my presence aboard the Trans-Balkan Express. You are excused, Lieutenant. Carry on. The Lieutenant, embarrassed, about-faced, and marched out. Angrily, he motioned his men from the corridor. The train master stood blinking, stupefied. Is, is there anything your highness could wish, sire? Yes, a uh, bottle of anisette for my friend and a ham sandwich for myself. Y immediately, your highness. And he stumbled away. Stubb looked slack-jawed at Blackie Lee. Your highness? He... they called you your highness! The train had started again, and he sank back, staring thoughtfully out of the window at the flying night. Stubb was nervous. This was the imperial suite of the Crown Hotel at the famous spa of Drachen, some 60 kilometers from the capital. Blackie Lee was in a jovial mood, Blackie would say that such popularity was a certain indication of their true worth and bid him be happy. Blackie had already done that, but it had not kept Stubb from suffering through the whole of a long day. Blackie would give out no information, but Stubb knew in the depths of his soul that Blackie Lee was about to haul him through further hell. As a respectful knock sounded upon the door, Blackie reared up from his bed, put on his big dark goggles, and called, Come in! A smirking little man minced into the room, carrying a small box. Does your highness wish a further fitting? We have had to accomplish this in such a hurry that I am very afraid that you will not be wholly pleased. No more fussing. Get out! <laughs> yes, your highness. <laughs> Stubb groaned and relaxed. Blackie <laughs> took off the dark goggles and began to tear his boxes open. Presently, a gratified mutter came from Blackie Lee. Huh. He was standing before a full-length mirror, surveying himself in a suit of tails. Not like London, but it will have to do. Well, you're not going out to dine. Why not? But whatever the hell you're up to, you might get caught. Uh, maybe you're using hypnotism on these guys, and, well, maybe, maybe you've gotten us to this place and put us in the royal suite and got some clothes, but there's a limit even to your luck. Get dressed. I'm scared. I don't talk this Magyar lingo like you do. Magyar. Well, talk French. That's it. You're a famous French physician. Ha! <laughs> Me? Yeah. A sawbones? Why, I couldn't even patch a blister. You're Dr. Cartier, the famous French psychiatrist. Yes, that's it. Pierre Cartier, specialist in abnormal psychology. Get dressed. Blackie put on his dark glasses and then an indigo opera cape, and he strolled to the door. I'll take a turn in the garden. Come down when you are ready. Oh. Blackie had wandered down the walk and was now disappearing on the shrubbery-lined paths of the garden. It was a very pleasant evening, mellow with the promise of warmer weather. He saw ahead of him a woman in a white satin gown and ermine evening cloak. She seemed to be waiting for him on the edge of a dark byway, and Blackie, wondering hopefully, quickened his pace. It was difficult to make out her face in these shadows, but he could suddenly feel the intensity of her. Philip! He inclined his head, coming to a stop two paces from her. Philip, you fool! I've 
20 kilometers to get you out of this place. What devil possessed you to show your face here? Are you out of your wits? If I, 20 kilometers away at my castle, heard you had come to Drachen, then Balchert, who has a dozen spies for every one of mine, is either here or will be here. Oh, soak up as much whiskey as you please, loll in bed for the rest of your life, but have the decency and the sense to know that your stupidity and carelessness put all our lives at stake. To hear is to obey. She had started to speak again, but she stopped and took a step closer to him, peering intently at his face. Her perfume went swirling around him like a gentle drug. Uh, I must say, there is something very odd about all this. Uh, you seem a little taller, a little straighter. And your voice... Uh... Perhaps, my lady. You have never before seen me sober? Ah! ah. <laughs> then you are sober. <laughs> For once in your wasteful, utterly useless life. Duh. You know, you weren't bad when you were a child, Philip. If you could cure yourself of all that rottenness, I might even marry you yet. I could never hope so high. <laughs> Gallantry. From you? Oh, this is too much. <laughs> Uh, you, who have always hated me and everything I stood for. A famous French physician, uh, Dr. Pierre Cartier, has created me a changed man, my lady. Oh. I see the error of my ways. And certainly a man that was even a third a man could not help but fall deeply in love with a woman as beautiful as you. You mock and we stand here chattering while any number of vulture's devils may be on their way. Yeah, I could not wait for my guard. My carriage is there upon the road. Come with me, uh, instantly. Uh, but how regrettable. I cannot accept. I have a dinner engagement. Oh, you fool! You simpering fool! Oh, you may have gotten the whiskey husk out of your voice and the hump out of your shoulders, but your brains, oh, they have not changed. You are stubborn, selfish whelp. Can't you even understand danger? And this is true danger. Oh, I never knew of you being brave before, Philip. But not brave. It's only that I cannot be rude. A dinner engagement that I must With confess With some of your theater women? Ugh. Oh. I cannot force you into sense. My guard will be here within the hour, and you'll go, even if I have to drag you. You can't put us all in jeopardy to satisfy your own sordid ideas of pleasure, you imbecile! Oh. My lord, what a woman. He was only half back to reality when a soft voice behind him startled your, him. Your Highness. He whirled. A dark blanket swooped upon him and then strong arms instantly pinioned him. He started to shout, but when he dragged in a breath, the sickish odor of chloroform came with it. From far, far off, he heard someone say, You might have rushed it, fool. I had to know for certain it was he, sir. This way. If Blackie Lee was ill when he came around, he gave no sign of it. He was seated at the head of a long table, unbound but not crumpled. In the dim distance lay a steaming pool. This was evidently an ancient bath, long unused and forgotten. Possibly it had remained untouched since the Roman times. There were several other men about the board, faces passionate and intelligent, pale from hiding and too little food and too much brooding. Far down the board from Blackie sat a man, merciless and mocking. All eyes were upon Blackie Lee. From a thin young devil on Blackie's left came the muttered snarl, I say, kill the filthy swine. The man at the foot of the table spoke. I am Belchard. You have heard of my plan, comrades. I lead the society which must save Aldoria from the idiotic cruelty of a tyrant. 
You see here the key members of the Sons of Freedom. But tonight, Your Highness, we are not under the guns of your bodyguard. On the contrary, Your Highness. Does anyone have a drink of brandy? Give the swine his brandy. A bottle and a glass were passed up the board, and Lee poured himself a drink. He sipped it. Mm. Thank you, gentlemen. Tonight, the fate of Aldoria is to be decided. Who has a cigarette? The young devil on his left angrily snapped open a case, and Blackie lighted up from the nearest candle. Swine. You know, of course, that the majority of these present have a decided leaning toward the idea of putting you to death here and now. I shouldn't wonder. This overtaxed and enslaved land would then be ridded of its unwanted and incompetent ruler. All of us have been your enforced guests at one time or another. Your minister, Gratch, is very clever and efficient, but only in matters of conscienceless bribery and graft. The intrigues of your detestable Countess Zeta and the activities of our private espionage corps are only to be equaled by the power and cunning of my own. You and Gratch and the Countess Zeta must be removed. You, because you are a stupid drunkard. Gratch, because he is a rapacious villain. Zeta, because she has acquired too much power. The one with the blonde hair? You mock us! <laughs> On the contrary, I take so little interest in such things. The will of the people should be and shall be the will of the government. Aldoria must be freed! Well, what makes you think it will be any freer in the hands of communists than in the hands of royalty? What's these? Why, in one case, one knows to whom things belong, but in the other, nobody ever knows. How much is Russia paying you to hand the Balkans to her orchard? There was an angry stir about the table, but there was also question and concern in some of the glances. So long as royalty rules, the Allied forces hold the balance of power in the Balkans. As soon as you are in power, Russia will snatch up and enslave and crush all the other states on these borders. Ah. You are wiser in these things than I gave you credit for being. You are definitely interested, then, in the political and international aspect of this situation. On the contrary, I am only interested in another drink of brandy. There was considerable whispering about the table. The young devil on Blackie's left said, Skill the filthy swine and have it done with. Your Highness, we know that your interests are mainly in bottles and evening gowns, and that anything outside Paris bores you. We are about to make a suggestion. Your Highness, which will probably receive, will probably receive with gladness. If you were to declare an election to stop this unrest, you know what the outcome of that election would be. The sons of freedom would win. The people will gladly exchange our idealism for your own bestial rule. Go on. Ah, then you are interested. Supposing, Your Highness, that you were to declare an election, which is a modern thing to do, and give the people a chance to choose their own form of government. Yes. And supposing, Your Highness, that in return, you were guaranteed five million francs, <laughs> placed to your credit in the Paris bank upon the condition of your accepting those election returns. Supposing that the sum was 20 million francs. Or 10. 12, then. 12. You are a wise fellow, Your Highness. You know that you would never be able to collect or touch such a sum without having to remain in the country. And even then, it would be difficult. Here, we have a few papers, mere uh, guarantees of faith. By all means. How fortunate to find you sober for a change. <laughs> That's how fortunate we met. <laughs> the first paper which was handed to him was an outright abdication, all prepared and waiting for his signature and a statement of faith signed by Balchard, listing the terms accompanied by a promissory note guaranteeing the sum in Paris. Blackie put out his hand and a pen was placed in it. The pen scratched out Philip, Archduke of Aldoria. Balchard's hands trembled and he took the paper back. Hastily, he compared the signature with several he had at hand and was satisfied with the authenticity of it. <laughs> Balchard emotionally poured out a glass of liquor and stood up. To the Socialist Republic of Aldoria! To the, to the Socialist, Socialist Republic, Republic of Aldoria! Blackie tucked the guarantee and the note inside his jacket and stood up. I am sorry to leave you so abruptly, <clears throat> gentlemen, but I have a dinner engagement. By all means, keep it. You will declare the election by the end of the week? 
Sir, sir, certainly, yes, 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 if indeed. Now, if I can uh, be shown the way out of this place. This way. Stubb was wild. He had torn through every inch of the garden and the hotel without once being able to stop and ask anybody any questions for fear Blackie had been taken by the authorities, who would then naturally be desirous of taking Stubb as well. And when at 9.30, distrait and on the verge of collapse to the point of needing a drink, he stumbled into the grill en route to the bar and found Blackie sitting there, sipping a glass of rare vintage as though he hadn't a thought in the world beyond his filet mignon. Bitterness welled in Stubb's heart. He marched straight up to the table and stood there, glaring. Ah, oh, hello, sweetheart. Have a drink? Oh, I'll have a drink. I'll have ten drinks, and then I'll tell you what I think of you. Now, oh, now, people are watching. Sit down, darling. This wine is very good. Uh, here, uh, waiter, another bottle of Chateau Vie, uh, 96, and some steak and good things for my good friend and physician. Uh, now, uh, Pierre, what we say? Pierre, Blackie Lee, you are going to tell me what this is all about here and now, or Have I'll, a drink. I'll... There. Cool your throat to no end. Cigarette? Hmm? Special brand they keep here for his highness in case he ever comes. Which he doesn't. Give. A cigarette? No, damn you. Information. What's this all about? Hush. Would it appease you to know that we are rich? Rich? Mm. Would it soothe you to know that we will soon go to Paris, buy off our dishonest debts, and live in luxury the rest of our lives? Oh, you got another idea. <laughs> Blackie, I can take just so much. That last ammunition deal unsettled your mind. Just how you ever hypnotized these people into calling you your highness? I, I didn't. Then why do they do it? How do you rate such a banquet? Why do they let you run up such bills? A reigning sovereign's credit is usually good in his own country. And now you think you're king of Aldoria. Honest to Pete Blackie, while you're at it, you better promote us a couple of cures, because if you're not having a, a nervous breakdown, I am! My boy. You've been with me only three years. <laughs> if it's only three, I'm still 30 years older. And for the past three years, His Royal Highness, the Archduke Philip of Aldoria, has been laid up dead drunk behind closed doors. What's that got to do with it? Why, three years ago, they threatened to cut him off without a yacht to his name if he didn't come home. That was Grotch's doing. Who's Grotch? Prime Minister of Aldoria. How do you know all this? A fellow walked up to me one day and paid me a gambling debt. Stay on the subject. I am on the subject, sweetheart. That was 10 years ago in Paris when life was in full tide. He came up to me while I was sitting at a sidewalk cafe and bowed and said, Your Highness, here is the 3,000 francs you won last night. Your Highness? And so, of course, I said thank you and banked the roll. I thought he was either drunk or blind or more or less forgot about it until one night, a redhead dashed up to me in a cafe and threw a glass of champagne in my face and told me to go back to Aldoria, where women were more likely to look at twice at pigs. <laughs> and a waiter rushed off and wiped me up and said, so sorry, your highness. Maybe I'm getting it. So I thought to myself that I had better look into this. I dug into the newspaper morgues and finally turned up a photograph of the Archduke Philip of Aldoria. He looked very much like me except perhaps for the eyes, but in bright sunlight or a dim cabaret, no one could see any real difference between us. Later, I patched back my history and found out that a younger son of the Hunbergs, to which royal family Philip also belongs, had been boosted forth into the world, had migrated into America, and had there set himself up in Denver, I think it was, as a pharaoh expert. Before he cold decked his last customer, a violent chap, he managed to get himself married to a decent girl. And very likely, I am descended from just that line. This is just a guesswork outlined I figured out for myself. Well, then you are royalty. Me? Well, umpteen times removed with neither nor arms, name nor arms, my pet. Somewhere in his past, every man is probably connected with the royal house. 
So you see. But what did you do when you found that out? I had a plan. I studied Aldorian, learned the language backwards and forwards. I set up my scheme to the nth degree, and then the police came inquisitive about some of the things I had been doing on the side, and I had to skip Paris. When that had blown over and I was back in there, it was just in time to read the news three years later that Philip had been called home or else. Certainly I wasn't risking my neck by walking into the man's own country. And so I lost all the hours I had spent working on his mannerisms and his signature. Or at least I thought I lost them. Have a drink with this, with this steak. Come on, sweetheart. Stop calling me sweetheart. If you think it's so dangerous to walk into Aldoria, why the hell are we here? I was either starved to death or crossed the border, and I detest starving. Some more wine, darling? Don't call me darling! Don't you know that if you're caught impersonating a king, you'll hang? And me with you, damn it! Blackie, let's get on the first train out of here before somebody finds out. Oh, let's stick around and see what happens. <laughs> but think what can happen. Grotch will get word you are here and he'll know yeah. Philip is really in the capital. And we'll be lugged off to the nearest gallows. And I don't mean tomorrow. Such gruesome thoughts after such a lovely dinner. Guys like us make fine corpses. It's a crime in any country to impersonate any official. Merely an archduke. Oh, he's king here, all right. Now listen to me, Blackie Lee. You get fancy ideas, and sometimes they work. But you are heading straight for the deepest and darkest pit there ever was. Nice. The intruder had come up with a great deal of silence, considering the sword chains and spurs he wore. He had his gleaming plumed helmet in the crook of his arm and was bowing with all deference. Well, it is my sorrowful duty, your highness, to ask you to accompany me. Blackie gauged his man. The fellow was young for a major and therefore he must have brains. Is this a common arrest? No, your highness, forgive me. The Countess Zita, whom I have the honor to serve as a major of her household troops, earnestly requests your presence in her carriage outside, that she may escort you back to the capital and your palace. The escort is large and you have nothing to fear, sire. Uh, I just remembered an engagement, uh, uh, your highness. Uh, oh, do don't go, doctor. Uh, Major, tell the Countess Zita that my physician and myself will be happy to avail ourselves of her courtesy. Uh, as soon as my wardrobe is packed, I shall join you in her carriage. Asking your forgiveness, your highness, but we will have this hotel surrounded. Uh, well, Major, <laughs> you have me there. A glass of wine? Thank you, sire. It is my privilege to join the Countess Zita in a few minutes. Here, uh, take this unbroken bottle uh, uh, and a glass out to her uh, with my compliments. It is really a rare vintage. <laughs> I won't go. It's straight to the gallows. Well, then get out and go get yourself stuck on a saber. <laughs> Personally, it's worth it to take a ride a few kilometers with such a woman. Stubb sat on the box beside the coachman a horse blanket about his shoulders, and shivered himself weary. The carriage was of patent leather, drawn by two teams of jet thoroughbreds whose harness everywhere bore the arms and insignia of the Countess Zita. The carriage was making many small noises, and the clomp of hooves was such that he could not distinguish their words until the cavalcade stopped a few moments. <laughs> but Wagner is so crude. Crude, no, not crude, but vital, uh, barbaric perhaps, but vital. Uh, the magic fire music, the most extraordinary. Ah, Ye gods, here the lives of two perfectly good men are at stake, and they're talking about opera. <laughs> Is Blackie out of his head? His highness looks astonishingly well. Did I understand properly when you heard that you were the physician responsible for that? Huh? Yeah. Uh, me? Uh, 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 well, we have an effective treatment for that sort of thing in uh, France. Hmm. Yes, I see what you mean. 
Uh, by the way, uh, couldn't we have taken the railroad to the capital? <laughs> we could have, but we must be careful of His Highness. We are crossing the mountains in a roundabout way to foil assassination attempts. The railroad has been discovered mined twice in the past week. Uh, assassination? <laughs> of course. Then, then this country must be pretty bothered about something. It's communism. His Highness, if you will forgive me, is not too easy on the people in that he leaves all his affairs in the hands of others. The peasants object, you know, taxes and lack of justice and such things. The Sons of Freedom have grown very powerful the past year. Now, if I had my way about it, I would find this Balchard and hang him by his heels at the palace gate and ride down his followers with the hounds. But no, Grotch fumbles around and expects everyone to die down. Why, do you know I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see a revolt within the next month or two? Of course, the nobles have adequate defenses if their troops don't desert. And I'm sure of my troops, naturally, and we'd win. But it would be nasty while it lasted. If His Highness were assassinated now, that would put us all in a bad way. For it would leave the country without a figurehead. And the people would never stand for Grotch ascending to the throne, as Grotch, of course, would do. That is why we must be so careful of His Highness. The people, even though they know that he uh, stays drunk most of the time, have some faith left in him. Grotch is the sore point. It was two o'clock when they arrived at the gates of Vorin, capital of Aldoria. The ancient city climbed steeply up a mountainside, many of its streets, wide flights of steps. The cries rolled and echoed as the guard tumbled out. The major leaped from his lathered horse and saluted the officer of the day. The Countess Zita, bringing his highness back. Hello, Feloy, said the officer of the day, and then, turning to an orderly, Prepare a barrack for the Countess's troops. Inform Grotch that the Countess Zita has arrived. Well, Feloy, how have you been? You evidently didn't understand me. His Highness is in that carriage. Turn out the Royal Guard. Not, of course, to tell you your business. What's that? His Highness? Correct. But good Lord, His Highness hasn't been out of his quarters for a week. How can he be in that carriage? He cannot only be, but he is. No, you're not drunk. Hmm. Well, on your head, Beard Foloy. Trumpeter, the Imperial Welcome Runner. Runner, carry the word of the arrival to His Highness to Grotch. Orderly, inform General Brun of His Highness's arrival. Foloy, this is crazy. His Highness hasn't been out of Vorin for three years. <laughs> the Major stepped to the carriage door and threw it open. A double rank of red-jacketed guardsmen, looking sleepily amazed, made two lines leading up the steps to the gigantic doors of the palace. Blackie Lee stepped down. With the Countess's hand upon his wrist, Blackie Lee strolled between the ranks of Scarlet and Steel up the steps. Outside an iron-studded doorway stood an apoplectic old man. He was just tying the cord of his dressing gown when he saw Blackie and the Countess. His wrinkled old face went slack and then tightened into lines of pettish anger. What the devil is this? Fumed Grotch. You let him get out and I brought him back. Grotch peered nearsightedly up into Blackie's face. What are you doing up and about at this hour of the night? He was in Drachen without escort, you careless simpleton. What if Balchard had been there, hmm? But uh, I put out your lights myself not four hours ago. In Drachen? I must be going mad. I could have told you that years ago. Uh, here, step in and close the door. Do you want me to catch cold here and stand here and kiss pneumonia? Blackie and the Countess followed him into the great hall, which served as his office and reception room. Grotch, fussing and sputtering, got around in back of his desk as though it were a sort of barricade. Why are you wearing dark glasses? Take them off. Blackie shrugged and took them off. Grotch had found some spectacles of his own, and with these he again peered closely at His Highness. This is madness. How could you change so in four hours? And how could you be in Draken at the same time as in bed? Blackie picked up a cigarette from the box on Grotch's desk. He blew the smoke insolently at Grotch. 
Go up and turn out the imposter who has taken my name for so long and bring him down here so that I may sentence him according to his deserts. What is this? Imposter? Imposter! The man who got back from Paris was a fellow named Blackie Lee. A soldier of fortune, a gambler, and an adventurer. He caused me to be dragged and took my papers and my name. Bring him down here so I can confront him with his crime and have him put away in a safe place where he can do no further harm. Neither Zeta nor Grotch moved for a space of seconds. All right, we'll see what this is about. Captain Dredd, ask his highness to grant me the courtesy of an interview in my office. The captain, who had been by the door and out of earshot, hurried away. Some time later, there was a commotion in the corridor and the sound of swearing. The doors burst open, and Philip, Archduke of Aldoria, stood there, supported on either side by an officer. There was no doubt about his being drunk. He weaved into the room and came to a lurching halt. What now, you murdering old mummy? Can't you even let me sleep? Grotch said not a word. His outstretched hand indicated Blackie Lee. Philip's reddened eyes focused upon Blackie. He stared. He made a pass at his eyes, blinked, and stared again. What's this all about? Mirrors? You know what this is all about. Surprised to see me, aren't you, Mr. Blackie Lee? Thought you'd put me out of the way forever, huh? Well, I came back. Back to claim what is rightfully mine. Guard! Put this imposter uh, so fast. <laughs> I'm afraid we'll have to have a little more proof than that. If you really are Philip, Archduke of Aldoria, then you would know the full name of your grandmother on your father's side. Ask him first. <laughs> That's fair. Answer the question. What the devil? You have the insolence to cross-question me? Why, well, you, you monkey-faced old blackguard! I'll have your heart! I'll have you spit it and dragged through the streets! Don't bluster, answer up. If you are really Philip of Aldoria, you would know such a thing. If you don't know such a thing... Philip perhaps... was white with rage and his words would not come. But gradually, it became to come home to him that he really was suspected of being an imposter. How the devil can I remember what the old dame's names were? See? Maria Barrett Grattenbuck and Rose Colvino, Duchess of Almagvina. Philip glared and began to rage, but Grotch silenced him. I admit it is uh, not too good a test. There is also the matter of signature. And he extended a pen to Philip, who finally snatched it and the paper and scrawled the name so viciously that the ink flew. Calmly, Blackie took the pen and wrote, Philip of Aldoria in a neat and proper hand. Grotch nodded thoughtfully over the paper and then looked at Blackie. I'm beginning to believe you. Uh, how was it that this fellow managed uh, in Paris to... Imbeciles! Apes! <laughs> to drag a man out of a warm bed and then tell him that he is not himself? Here! Here. I'll make you prove it, you devil. One and all know that Philip of Aldoria has a triangular scar upon his shoulder received in a fall from a horse! And he ripped off his ah! pajama jacket and turned the scar to them. One and all, he said, knew it, but one man hadn't known it. Blackie Lee, very calmly, placed cloak and coat upon a chair near the wall, which, strangely enough, was just under a shield and a pair of long swords. There was a swish and a sing of suddenly living steel, and the point of the weapon was at the throat of the stupefied Captain Drett. Be very quiet, all of you. Grotch. Go to the door and order my carriage to be ready. Countess Zita stood with one hand to her breast, her eyes bright with interest, a pulse beating under the creamy smoothness of her throat. But Grotch knew what a wild chance and a slim one Blackie Lee had of getting past the guard in the hall. Certainly. Grotch vanished from behind his desk. There was the excited clamor of an alarm gong he had touched off. Blackie hurled Dredd from him and leaped for Philip. The Archduke tried to dodge and then found himself made into a shield. Just as the doors burst open and Red Jacketed guards rushed in, they faltered and stopped, St uncertain. Stand away! 
A shot sounded behind Blackie. Grotch, smoking pistol in hand, stood behind an open drawer. His seamed face bore a smile of triumph. Blackie stood there, weaving a little, his face pale. And he fell forward to the rug and lay there, a small hole in his shirt back, turning slowly red. It was a dreary day when I first met the man they call Blackie Lee. <laughs> Sit down or fall down, but if you don't stop pacing back and forth, the Aldorian government will be sending you a bill for wearing out the floor of this cell. Three weeks of this is enough to make anybody wear out floors. It ain't the situation, it's the suspense. I mean, why did they bother getting all those doctors in here to look after you? Why didn't they just stand us up against the wall and let us have it? Are we going to spend the rest of our lives in here? Not even a trial. Why, there's been nobody to see us even. For all the attention that we've gotten us, yeah, well, we might as well be dead. You think you got things to worry you? I suppose you got more. Yeah. I got a little matter of 12 million francs waiting for us in Paris. What? You heard me. 12 million francs. But how? Who, who from? Why? The sons of freedom... Guaranteed to divvy up that much if the Archduke Philip declares an election and is thereby forced to abdicate. But you can't work that. Who knows? You mean you've got an idea. I mean I've got an idea. <laughs> Why else would I write to Grotch? You wrote Grotch? What'd you say? Whatever I said, if I said it right, he should be here to see us in an hour or two. From the information I pried out of the sentry. What was that what you were talking about with him? Stop interrupting me if you want information. You know as well as I do that there have been at least five riots around and about Vorin. The Sons of Freedom had reason to believe an election would soon be announced. So they noised it. And when it wasn't announced, the riots began. Baltard is stirring up this country as if it were a bee's nest. He's going to have an election and get the communists in power if he has to blow up the whole of Aldoria. Well, what's that got to do with you and 12 million francs? If I am responsible for the election, why then we collect? You sometimes make me think I'm hearing things. How could you order an election? And then Grotch, carefully, backed by two armed officers, entered the cell. Grotch stood looking at Blackie. Grotch's evil little face was speculating. You wrote me a letter. I did. And may I ask, what is it to you if the Archduke Philip stays on the throne? Maybe it's because we look alike and his death would be like losing half of myself. And maybe not. You are well again? Well as ever. Grotch looked around the cell, his eyes coming to rest on a pile of books upon the table. Where did you get those? I thought you had them sent. <laughs> Me? How would I know if you could read? He took the top volume. Shelley, how is it that the Countess Zita can bribe her way past my guards? Zita? Shelley is her favorite poet. I make it my business to know everything about my enemies. How did she send them to you, the person that I ordered held without communication? Why, they just came in, that's all. Every couple of days, the guard would hand through a package and it would be a book. No note, nothing. See here, Grotch, is this a plot of some sort? Are you sure the Countess Zeta sent these books? As if you don't know. The chickens! What chickens? Oh, so she sent you food as well. Uh, she sends you food? Food and books to a person in my prison that I have ordered held without communication? You mean you didn't send the chickens? And the wine and so on? Why should I send a cheap adventurer like you chickens and the Shelly and the wine? That was why I wrote to you. When all those docs came and fixed me up and looked after me and books and food were sent, I thought you had something in mind, a reason to keep me alive and happy. So she sent you physicians into my prison to my prisoner. Oh, wait until I see her again. Blackie had drifted off absently and was staring out the window. But that is not the business at hand. You said you could help me quell the disorders that have broken out. I have no knowledge of your ideas on the subject. 
I don't want any knowledge of them. I have my own plans. When your letter came, I suddenly conceived a way to avert disaster. With me included? With you included. It has occurred to me that if the Archduke were only brave enough and willing to make a public appearance, the populace might again have some faith in him. The stories of his drunkenness have gained a too wide a circulation, and the people are howling for an election. That election must not take place. If the Archduke Philip could make a strong public appeal in person, we might again quiet Aldoria. And? But the Sons of Freedom have threatened his life. And if he does not immediately abdicate, a public appearance would be a highly dangerous undertaking. And so we cannot trust Philip to carry it out. I have ordered the dedication of a new bridge, and I have proclaimed that Philip would be there in person. You, my swashbuckling bravo, will be there instead of Philip. Highly dangerous. Highly. And what do I get out of this? You will serve my purposes for a month or two. At the end of that time, you may have your liberty. And nothing more? And nothing more! Refuse this, and you'll never be heard of again. Hard terms. I am a hard man. But I'll take them. You are wise. Tomorrow morning, you will be taken to the royal wardrobe and dressed. Tomorrow noon, you will dedicate the new bridge. What if I am assassinated? <laughs> we will pretend you are merely wounded, and Philip, day after tomorrow, will appear for a moment on a balcony to reassure the people. I have thought of everything. There is no doubt about that. Grotch about-faced and went limping out into the corridor. The cell door clanged behind him. So it was Sita. I thought we were merely being fattened for future use by Grotch. Sometimes, Stubb, I think I am a fool. <laughs> Sometimes I know it! The master of the wardrobe had done marvels. And so it was at 10.30 that Blackie Lee waited for his carriage. After a while, Stubb noticed that Blackie kept looking for someone. Zeta. No, it can't be Zeta. Certainly, Blackie Lee has more sense than to cast eyes at a countess who would have to marry someone of her station. The carriage came at last, brilliant with colors and heraldry. Grotch came with it. May I remind you that while you may be wearing the uniform of Philip Avaldoria, all brave with medals, you are in reality Blackie Lee, wanted by nearly every government in Europe. But Blackie had not seemed to have heard him, for he was again looking toward the gate. He faced Grotch. Listen, you old buzzard. Where is the Countess Zeta? <laughs> so he also has romantic ideas. My fine bravo, you had better forget the Countess Zeta, for many a man far more worthy than yourself has sighed in her direction quite in vain. Get into that carriage. I shall be waiting for news. Somewhere up ahead, a band struck up. The carriage rolled out through the arch, across the drawbridge, and down the curving street. People on the walks stood silent, their faces expressionless. Blackie felt it. He knew that the breaking point was almost reached. Two blocks farther along, he caught a glimpse of a face in the crowd, a sharp, violent sort of face, pale and merciless. Balchard. He had promised to announce the election within a week, but that had been three weeks ago. But by the time the procession had stopped in the small park and Blackie had walked up to the platform that had been built, most of the guard that had clogged the streets had trailed along and stood now in much the same silence upon the lawn of the park. Blackie faced them. In a mechanical, disinterested voice, he began to read the pompous nothingness in the lines. People of Aldoria. A shrill voice in the mob day. cried, Devil take the bridge! We came here to know about the election! Blackie halted and looked down across the thousands. Yeah, what about the elections? Balchard's sons of freedom were staging this, Blackie knew. He's afraid to hold an election! He knows the people will die! 
The elections! We demand to know! Elections! Tell us about the elections! Blackie sighed. He gave one last hopeless look around. And then he tore the written speech into four sections and hurled the fragments fluttering from him. I'll tell you about the elections. I proclaim here and now, officially, that the elections will take place upon the last Thursday of this month. There was chaos behind him. Chaos and cheers before him. Somehow, Captain Dredd got him by the arm and dragged him away. Blackie stretched out his legs and looked thoughtfully into the fireplace. This was the north turret, and through the qu- though the quarters were large, Blackie Lee was a prisoner. He was needed too much to be thrown into a cell again. Why shouldn't I do it? But you might as well have sent us all to the headsman's block and have done with it. If they had revolted, our troops are loyal enough and good enough to handle them. And we would have crushed these upstarts under Balchart. But we cannot draw back from this election. What folly! What a mockery! Balchart has been praying for this to happen. And now that it has happened, he is in his glory. No use for a lot of innocent people to get killed. Even if you had crushed the revolt, you'd still have to watch the whole nation. That's not your reason. You play life as though it were a game of cards. You have no scruples. Perhaps you are too big and too strong to believe in anything but your own laws. But this time, you have played your hand too far. I do not know what it was. What, I do not know what it was at the bottom of this, but I know it is dark and it is awful. Answer me. Answer me, Blackie Lee. Why did you do this? Perhaps because you were not there. I? What could I have to do with it? You sent me Shelley and food and wine and doctors. When I learned that, for I was too stupid to think of it, I thought for a little while that you might be interested in me, whatever I am. And then, well, you knew I might be going out there to get a bullet or a bomb, and you didn't appear. Well, that's that. You didn't appear, and I announced the election. Now I am going through with it. Yes. Yes, you are going through with it. Philip is drunk, and you must go out and make his speeches. Yes, you've gone out and made them, and made a mess of them. Oh, I don't know. I always thought I was pretty good at making speeches. You could be if you wanted to be. I punctuated them rather nicely, and so far I've avoided getting killed, and that is a trick in itself. (sighs) Here I've been pouring out my very soul for your country in silvery oratory, and you criticize me. You mock me! Uh, By the way, how old are you? 26. Ever think think of marriage? Marriage? (laughs) If I ever meet the man that can get the better of me, then I'll marry him. Haven't met him yet, huh? Uh, Certainly not. Blackie poured himself a small glass of brandy and then, on impulse, gave it to her and poured himself another. So you don't know why I announced that election? I certainly do not. And I came here to find out. Well, I'll tell you. I made a bargain with Balchard some time ago and he, thinking me, Philip, is ready to keep it. A bargain? With Balchard? He offered me a Paris income of 12 million francs if I ordered an election and lost it. Philip won't know about that. I do. I'll claim it in Paris. You expect Balchard to keep that bargain? Why not? A year of his rule and the people would welcome back Philip. But, but, but Balchard will never let us out of the country alive. He'll have us all killed! And even now, the people are so excited about this election that no amount of threat can extract the tax receipts. 
And the news of this election has wrecked our national credit. We cannot borrow or beg. And our troops are mainly mercenaries. She was still realizing at last exactly what Blackie had said. You... You sold us out! You sold out Aldoria for 12 million francs! You knew Philip would probably never know or claim it, and that he might be killed. You knew you could discount a rumor of his death. You sold us out! The brandy glass crashed to the floor and Zeta stumbled to her feet. Now, you make speeches and appearances just good enough to make sure that you will lose, that we will lose. You are gambling with our very lives, with a nation. Why not? And now you say, why not? I told you why I did it. And why was that beyond an unholy thirst for gain? <laughs> because you didn't come to make sure I came through that parade alive. I suppose there is no use in arguing with you. You will carry this thing through and make certain of our loss. Sit down. Yes, sir? He reached for her and took her wrist and gave it a slight twist so that she had to sink into her chair. <coughs> no man had ever dared to lay a hand on her. The experience did not register. You say there was no way to make me change. I admit the thing has gone so far that almost nothing could stop it or keep Balchard out of this palace. But there is yet another bargain I might make. And that? Well, if you would consent to be my wife, <laughs> I might be able to win this election for the crown. <laughs> she would have started up. <coughs> it's a moving scene. Another slight twist of her wrist brought her back to the chair again. She was white even to her lips, and her eyes were pure flame. You devil! You asked if there was a way? You, you, you would double-cross Balchard? He made no bargain with me, but with the man he thought was Philip. Huh. She got up and paced up and down the heart, twisting at the silken handkerchief in her hand. If I consent to this, uh, you will take my word. Certainly. Oh. Very well. If, <laughs> if, if you can swing this election to the crown, I will take you as my husband. Done. A drink on it? I do not drink this wine. And very straight, Aww. she marched from the room. Stubb, sitting at the side of the platform, was in a state of dull amazement. He knew that Blackie Lee could talk. He had seen Blackie take many an angry crowd and send them away cheering. In the last three towns, Blackie Lee had left in a carriage full of flowers, with the populace straining its lungs in the shout. Long live Philip! It was wrong, all wrong. Stubb had faith in one heckler. The fellow was a big bruiser, evidently the town bully. And he was coming through every few words with the Aldorian equivalent of... Oh, yeah? No violence. A strange order from an archduke or anyone impersonating an archduke. The bruiser was getting louder and funnier, yeah. interrupting Blackie at nearly every word. And Blackie was suddenly but politely annoyed. You don't like what I say? Address the bully lost some of his cockiness, but he had the courage to roar... No, I don't like it. Blackie thereupon did something very strange. He took off his blue uniform coat and, along with his sword, laid it upon the speaker's table. He came down the steps, rolling up his sleeves. You still don't like it? Who is going to make me? Blackie answered, but not with words. The bully picked himself off the grass about ten feet away and, berserk with pain, charged in. He lit 12 feet away, got up, and charged in again. He lit 15 feet away and stayed down. Blackie went back to the platform, put on his coat, and started to go on with his speech. But there were too many cheers. 
A little later, rolling along the hot white road between the lines of red-jacketed hussars, Stubb complained as he poured Blackie a drink. That's gonna make you popular back there. What the hell are you trying to do, win this election? Think there's any chance? I hope not. I thought it was worth 12 million francs to us to lose this election. That's what you thought. But soon they were in the next town, and the people were all out on the green, and the Sons of Freedom man made his case for communism and got cheered until everyone was hoarse. And then Blackie got up and began his speech. There was a big bruiser right in front who kept yelling the Aldorian equivalent of... Oh, yeah? Stubb gulped and stared. The same man. And in a moment, the same fight. Riding off again to howls of... Is that guy? Oh, him? Uh, that's the ape from Aldoria. He's been to America and he knows all about taking a fall. But good lord, such tricks will win this election. Well? But. Uh, 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 I don't care what you've done in the country, I still say we'll never carry Vorin. Baltrid's machine will pack the boxes and resort to every vile trick he's ever heard about. He has advice straight from Moscow, and those Russians are experts. A country town is different. You couldn't do anything dishonest without everyone knowing it. But here in Vorin, Baltrid's party will win, and Vorin has enough votes to carry the election. Go away. Bad enough to have to talk all day without talking all night to you. But tomorrow is the day. At nine, the polls open and we know for certain that we will never carry Vorin. Why, every other man is a member of the Sons of Freedom here. Who is the administrative genius here, you or I? You are getting a trifle too gay with all this newfound glory, my fine bravo. Censure from you is very funny, but I happen to be too tired to laugh. Except just then. What's it worth? 10,000 Zetestas. 20,000. Cash on this table. After a little, Grotch came back with 20,000 Zetestas and laid them on the table. Blackie counted them and thrust the roll into his jacket pocket. It is now 7 o'clock. In other words, you have a whole night ahead. Go shake Philip out of his stupor and get him to sign a proclamation. Or I'll sign it since they're one and the same. About what? For years, ever since Turkey started it, Women in these small states have been shouting for complete suffrage. Granted. What? Give women the right to vote. Issue the proclamation tonight. It is valid because your government is still valid. They'll be so wild with joy and so grateful that they'll vote for Philip. It might work, but that will only balance the vote. It won't guarantee a win. For I know that these boxes will be stuffed. We couldn't keep the Sons of Freedom from the ballot boards. Run along and write fancy things on pieces of parchment. Personally, I am going to get me a good night's sleep. It would have been very unlike Blackie to have told anything resembling the truth. As soon as Grotch had left, Blackie sent an orderly loping out to find Stubb. Stubb came. Sweetheart, has that package came from Bucharest arrived? Day before yesterday, and don't call me sweetheart. Then go get it and put on your hat and coat. We're going places. Hey, I <laughs> thought they wouldn't let you out of their sight. Uh, but Dredd will go along with us and maybe half a dozen troopers. The usual quiet private party. Say, Blackie. Yes? Are you sure you feel all right? No fever or anything? Why? I don't know. But I wish to Pete you'd make up your mind whether you want to win or lose. One minute I got visions of myself riding around in limousines, and the next I can hear myself saying, Mister, give me a dime for a cup of coffee. If I've got it right, if we lose, we make 12 million francs. If we win, we get put over the border into the arms of our old execution-minded pals. Stop worrying about your head about such pretty details and get that package. Okay, okay. <laughs> the Countess Zita sat in lonely splendor in her lavish Vorin apartments. Since dawn, 
Her bags had been packed. But as the hours dragged and tidings came, the necessity for escape grew more and more remote. For the election, despite all the brawling and bellowing of the Sons of Freedom, was a landslide for the crown. Continued monarchy. The North wanted it, the East and the West wanted it, and Vorin, Vorin most of all, had abruptly turned angry backs upon the Sons of Freedom and had fought to get into the polls, men and frenzied women alike, to maintain Philip's reign. The Countess Zita alone had not been overjoyed. She had drifted briefly through the town in her carriage and had seen with her own eyes the words that had electrified the populace. To all those who believe Philip has not the good of Aldoria at heart. Below this was a copy of an agreement signed by Balchard himself to the effect that Philip was to receive 12 million francs from the Aldorian public treasury if he would abdicate. And there was a promissory note to confirm the bargain. But, worst blow of all to Balchard, that note bore the added line, Faithfully guaranteed by the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin. The Countess Zita went back to her apartment and shut herself off from the mad town. At 9.30, the tabulating was nearly finished, and it began to dawn upon her that if Blackie Lee was coming for her, he would shortly be here. She heard a servant answer a bell. But Folloy didn't announce Blackie Lee. He announced Stubb Doyle. Stubb held his hat nervously in one hand and a letter in the other. Stubb was red-faced and embarrassed. He uh, sent me over with this, my lady. He was impertinent enough to demand that I come to him. She snatched the letter. The Countess Zita. My lady... The election has been won. You have, you suppose, lost. But allow me to correct that impression. Years ago, I found that I resembled our friend Philip and planned to cash in upon that resemblance in Paris. In that, I failed. Some time ago, I found myself hard-pressed by the Nazi government and to choose between starvation in Austria or a moment of plenty in Eldoria. I chose the latter. I was about to take my leave when you met me on that garden path and proceeded to deliver a verbal lashing. Shortly after, Balchard mistook me for Philip and made me a bargain, for he had long awaited that chance. I sighed, naturally, to save my skin. You delivered me to the palace, and I had to try and brazen it out. You sent me food and wine and books, as though I were some stray tramp. I assume by now that you are convinced that you will have to go through with an onerous bargain. Not so, my lady. It would have been quite impossible to have collected that sum from Balchard, election or no election. It was quite impossible to win this election. But it is won. I am afraid, my lady, that all men are blurs to you. I hope that you find some fellow who will give you even a worse drubbing than I have. If you ever marry, my dear lady, I hope your husband ignores you. By the time you receive this, I shall be en route elsewhere. I leave in your hands my little friend, Stubb Doyle, for I fear that my further company will complete his ruin. Your bridegroom, not to be, Blackie Lee. Uh, P.S. And I hope he tells you that all your hats look badly upon you. Blackie Lee was curled up in the corner of a compartment and sleeping the sleep of the innocent. The trainmaster was shaking him. Sire, we are almost to Vorin. He had left Vorin at least six hours ago, and the next stop ought to be the frontier. Vorin? Vorin, sire. We are just coming into the station now. Am I crazy, or is it both of us? We were stopped, sire, and ordered to return to Vorin. Blackie could hear voices and then was nearly blinded by the lights of the station. He stared down at the upraised faces, all red with yelling, lighted by the torches. And there were banners, banners, banners. Long live the Iron Duke! Long live the Iron Duke! 
Blackie wonderingly waved a hand at the crowd, supposing that the right thing to do, and it promptly went delirious. There was Major Folloy ready to hand him down. People surged and pushed and pawed and tried to touch him. Long live the Iron Duke! Somehow Major Folloy got him into a carriage, but the mob came right along with it, and so did the band and the barriers and the torches. Long live the Iron Duke! How do you like it? Uh, I, I like it all right, but uh, what's it all about? <laughs> Why, it just happened that <laughs> Philip himself got a hold of some of those copies you had posted around. What's that got to do with it? <laughs> well, he was so angry at having missed such a bargain that he nearly killed himself. <laughs> and so? <gasps> and so he told me, uh, he told the person of influence that if he received a hundred thousand francs a year that he'd be glad to leave the country. And he signed an order of abdication in favor of one Duke Lee, his cousin, who looks so much like him. He signed, say, look here, <laughs> that doesn't explain all this reception. What about... <laughs> the whole truth was then released by that uh, person of influence. Uh, when one is put to it, you know, a great deal can be done in a very short time. And when it was discovered that it was you and not Philip who had whipped the country bullies and made sly bargains with Balchard and given women complete suffrage, <laughs> why, they, would have, they wouldn't have let you out of this country in any event. You're a national hero. And it seems the new ruler of Aldoria. Hassan! Oh, the Duke! The Iron Duke! Hey! He was dizzy with the shouting that was going up in the streets. Dazed by her perfume, stunned by his sudden rise, for once in his life, life was a little too much for Blackie Lee. And my head? Do you like it? It's terrible. <laughs> and poor Stubb, in the vestibule of the church the following week, could only look down the aisle and shake his woefully bothered head. And I thought that that guy was crazy. 